The Ancient City A Study on the Religion, Laws, and Institutions of Greece and Rome Numa Denis Fustel de Coulanges Book 2, The Family Chapter 7, The Right of Succession First Nature and Principle of the Right of Succession Among the Ancients The right of property having been established for the accomplishment of an hereditary worship, it was not possible that this right should fail after the short life of an individual. The man dies, the worship remains, the fire must not be extinguished, nor the tomb abandoned. So long as the domestic religion continued, the right of property had to continue with it. Two things are closely allied in the creeds as well as in the laws of the ancients, the family worship and its property. It was therefore a rule without exception, in both Greek and Roman law, that a property could not be acquired without the worship, or the worship without the property. Religion prescribes, says Cicero, that the property and the worship of a family shall be inseparable, and that the care of the sacrifices shall always devolve upon the one who receives the inheritance. At Athens an orator claims a succession in these terms. Weigh it well, O judges, and say whether my adversary or I ought to inherit the estate of Philoctoman, and offer the sacrifices upon his tomb. Could one say more directly that the care of the worship was inseparable from the succession? It was the same in India. He who inherits, whoever he may be, is bound to make the offerings upon the tomb. From this principle were derived all the rules regarding the right of succession among the ancients. The first is that, the domestic religion being, as we have seen, hereditary from male to male, property is the same. As the son is the natural continuator of the religion, he also inherits the estate. Thus the rule of inheritance is found, it is not the result of a simple agreement made between men, it is derived from their belief, from their religion, from that which has the greatest power over their minds. It is not the personal will of the father that causes the son to inherit. The father need not make a will, the son inherits a full right. Ipso iure eres existit. He becomes the heir by the rule itself. Says the jurisconsult. He is even a necessary successor. Eres necessarius. He has neither to accept nor to reject the inheritance. The continuation of the property, like that of the worship, is for him an obligation as well as a right. Whether he wishes it or not, the inheritance falls to him, whatever it may be, even with its encumbrances and its debts. The right to inherit without the debts, and to reject an inheritance, was not allowed to the son in Greek legislation, and was not introduced until a later period into Roman law. The judicial language of Rome calls the son. Eres sus. Self-successor. As if one should say. Eres suipsius. Heir of his own right. In fact, he inherits only of himself. Between his father and him there is neither donation, nor legacy, nor change of property. There is simply a continuation. Morte parentis continuatur dominium. Ownership is continued at the death of the parent. Already, during the life of the father, the son was co-proprietor of the field and house. Vivo quoc patre dominus existimatur. He is deemed the proprietor even while the father is alive. To form an idea of inheritance among the ancients, we must not figure to ourselves a fortune which passes from the hands of one to those of another. The fortune is immovable, like the hearth, and the tomb to which it is attached. It is the man who passes away. It is the man who, as the family unrolls its generations, arrives at his hour appointed to continue the worship and to take care of the domain. Second. The son, not the daughter, inherits. It is here that ancient laws, at first sight, appear whimsical and unjust. We experience some surprise when we see in the Roman law that the daughter does not inherit if she is married, and that, according to the Greek law, she does not inherit in any case. What concerns the collateral branches appears, at first sight, still farther removed from nature and justice. This is because all these laws flow, according to a very rigorous logic, from the creed and religion that we have described above. The rule for the worship is, that it shall be transmitted from male to male, 
the rule for the inheritance is, that it shall follow the worship. The daughter is not qualified to continue the paternal religion, since she may marry, and thus renounce the religion of her father to adopt that of her husband, she has, therefore, no right to the inheritance. If a father should happen to leave his property to a daughter, this property would be separated from the worship, which would be inadmissible. The daughter could not even fulfill the first duty of an heir, which was to continue the series of funeral repasts, since she would offer the sacrifices to the ancestors of her husband. Religion forbade her, therefore, to inherit from her father. Such is the ancient principle, it influenced equally the legislators of the Hindus and those of Greece and Rome. The three peoples had the same laws, not that they had borrowed from each other, but because they had derived their laws from the same belief. After the death of the father, says the Code of Manu, let the brothers divide the patrimony among them. And the legislator adds, that he recommends the brothers to endow their sisters, which proves that the latter have not of themselves any, right to the paternal succession. This was the case, too, at Athens. Demosthenes, in his orations, often has occasion to show that daughters cannot inherit. He is himself an example of the application of this rule, for he had a sister, and we know, from his own writings, that he was the sole heir to the estate, his father had reserved only the seventh part to endow the daughter. As to Rome, the provisions of primitive law which excluded the daughters from the inheritance are not known to us from any formal and precise text, but they have left profound traces in the laws of later ages. The institutes of Justinian still excluded the daughter from the number of natural heirs, if she was no longer under the power of the father, and she was no longer under the power of the father after she had been married according to the religious rites. From this it follows that, if the daughter before marriage could share the inheritance with her brother, she had not this right after marriage had attached her to another religion and another family. And, if this was still the case in the time of Justinian, we may suppose that in primitive law, this principle was applied in all its rigor, and that the daughter not yet married, but who would one day marry, had no right to inherit the estate. The institutes also mention the old principle, then obsolete, but not forgotten, which prescribed that an inheritance always descended to the males. It was clearly as a vestige of this old rule, that, according to the civil law, a woman could never be constituted an heiress. The farther we ascend from the institutes of Justinian towards earlier times, the nearer we approach the rule that woman could not inherit. In Cicero's time, if a father left a son and a daughter, he could will to his daughter only one-third of his fortune, if there was only a daughter, she could still have but half. We must also note that, to enable this daughter to receive a third or half of this patrimony, it was necessary that the father should make a will in her favor, the daughter had nothing of full right. Finally, a century and a half before Cicero, Cato, wishing to revive ancient manners, proposed and carried the Voconian law, which forbade, 1. Making a woman an heiress, even if she was an only child, married or unmarried. 2. The willing to a woman of more than a fourth part of the patrimony. The Voconian law merely renewed laws of an earlier date, for we cannot suppose it would have been accepted by the contemporaries of the Scipios if it had not been supported upon old principles which they still respected. It re-established what time had changed. Let us add that it contained nothing regarding heirship. Abintestat. In the absence of a will. Probably because on this point the old law was still in force, and there was nothing to repair on the subject. At Rome, as in Greece, the primitive law excluded the daughter from the heritage, and this was only a natural and inevitable consequence of the principles which religion had established. It is true men soon found out a way of reconciling the religious prescription which forbade the daughter to inherit with the natural sentiment which would have her enjoy the fortune of her father. The law decided that the daughter should marry the heir. Athenian legislation carried this principle to its ultimate consequences. If the deceased left a son and a daughter, the son alone inherited and endowed his sister, if they were not both children of the same mother, he had his choice to marry her or to endow her. If the deceased left only a daughter, his nearest of kind was his heir, but this relative, who was of course also a near relative of the daughter, was required, nevertheless, to marry her. More than this, if this daughter was already married, 
she was required to abandon her husband in order to marry her father's heir. The heir himself might be already married, in this case, he obtained a divorce, in order to marry his relative. We see here how completely ancient law ignored nature to conform to religion. The necessity of satisfying the requirements of religion, combined with the desire of saving the interests of an only daughter, gave rise to another subterfuge. On this point Hindu law and Athenian law correspond marvelously. We read in the laws of Manu. He who has no male child may require his daughter to give him a son, who shall become his, and who may perform the funeral ceremonies in his honor. In this case the father was required to admonish the husband to whom he gave his daughter, by pronouncing this formula. I give you this daughter, adorned with jewels, who has no brother, the son born of her shall be my son, and shall celebrate my obsequies. The custom was the same at Athens, the father could continue his descent through his daughter, by giving her a husband on this special condition. The son who was born of such a union was reputed the son of the wife's father, followed his worship, assisted at his religious ceremonies, and later guarded his tomb. In Hindu law this child inherited from his grandfather, as if he had been his son, it was exactly the same at Athens. When the father had married his daughter in the manner we have described, his heir was neither his daughter nor his son-in-law, it was the daughter's son. As soon as the latter had attained his majority, he took possession of the patrimony of his maternal grandfather, though his father and mother were still living. This singular tolerance of religion and law confirms the rule which we have already pointed out. The daughter was not qualified to inherit, but, by a very natural softening of the rigor of this principle, the only daughter was considered as an intermediary by whom the family might be continued. She did not inherit but the worship and the inheritance were transmitted through her. Third. Of the collateral succession. A man died without children, to know who the heir of his estate was, we have only to learn who was qualified to continue his worship. Now, the domestic religion was transmitted by blood from male to male. The descent in the male line alone established between two men the religious relation which permitted one to continue the worship of the other. What is called relationship, as we have seen above, was nothing more than the expression of this relation. One was a relative because he had the same worship, the same original sacred fire, the same ancestors. But one was not a relative because he had the same mother, religion did not admit of kinship through women. The children of two sisters, or of a sister and a brother, had no bond of kinship between them, and belonged neither to the same domestic religion nor to the same family. These principles regulated the order of succession. If a man, having lost his son and his daughter, left only grandchildren after him, his son's son inherited, but not his daughter's son. In default of descendants, he had as an heir his brother, not his sister, the son of his brother, not the son of his sister. In default of brothers and nephews, it was necessary to go up in the series of ascendants of the deceased, always in the male line, until a branch of the family was found that was detached through a male, then to redescend in this branch from male to male, until a living man was found, this was the heir. These rules were in force equally among the Hindus, the Greeks, and the Romans. In India, the inheritance belongs to the nearest Sapinda, in default of a Sapinda, to the Samanodika. Now, we have seen that the relationship which these two words expressed was the religious relationship, or the relationship through the males, and corresponded to the Roman agnation. Here, again, is the law of Athens. If a man dies without children, the heir is the brother of the deceased, provided he is a consanguineous brother, in default of him, the son of the brother, for the succession always passes to the males, and to the descendants of males. They still cited this old law in the time of Demosthenes, although it had already been modified, and they had commenced at this epoch to admit relationship through women. In the same way, the Twelve Tables ordained that, if a man died without his heir, the succession belonged to the nearest agnate. Now, we have seen that one was never an agnate through females. The ancient Roman law also specified that the nephew inherited from the Patrus, that is to say, from his father's brother, and did not inherit from the Avunculus, his mother's brother. By returning to the table which we have traced of the family of the Scipios, it will be seen that, Scipio Emilianus, having died without children, 
his estate could not pass either to Cornelia, his aunt, or to C. Gracchus, who, according to our modern ideas, was his cousin German, but to Scipio Asiaticus, who was really his nearest of kin. In the time of Justinian, the legislator no longer understood these old laws, they appeared unjust to him, and he complained of the excessive rigor of the laws of the Twelve Tables, which always accorded the preference to the masculine posterity, and excluded from the inheritance those who were related to the deceased only through females. Unjust laws, if you will, for they made no account of natural affection, but singularly logical laws, for setting out from the principle that the inheritance was attached to the worship, they excluded from the inheritance those whom this religion did not authorize to continue the worship. Fourth. Effects of Emancipation and Adoption We have already seen that emancipation and adoption produced a change in a man's worship. The first separated him from the paternal worship, the second initiated him into the religion of another family. Here also the ancient law conformed to the rules of religion. The son who had been excluded from the paternal worship by emancipation was also excluded from the inheritance. On the other hand, the stranger who had been associated in the worship of a family by adoption became a son there, he continued its worship, and inherited the estate. In both cases ancient law made more account of the religious tie than of the tie of birth. As it was contrary to religion that one man should have two domestic worships, so he could not inherit from two families. Besides, the adopted son, who inherited of the adopting family, did not inherit from his natural family. Athenian law was very explicit on this point. The orations of Attic orators often show us men who have been adopted into a family, and who wish to inherit in the one in which they were born, but the law was against them. The adopted son could not inherit from his own family unless he re-entered it, he could not re-enter it except by renouncing the adopting family, and he could leave this latter only on two conditions, the one was, that he abandoned the patrimony of this family, the other was, that the domestic worship, for the continuation of which he had been adopted, did not cease by his abandonment, and, to make this certain, it was necessary for him to leave this family a son, who should replace him. This son took charge of the worship, and inherited the estate, the father could then return to the family of his birth, and inherit its property. But this father and son could no longer inherit from each other, they were not of the same family, they were not of kin. We can easily see what was the idea of the old legislator when he established these precise rules. He did not suppose it possible that two estates could fall to the same heir, because two domestic worships could not be kept up by the same person. Fifth. Wills were not known originally. The right of willing, that is to say, of disposing of one's property after death, in order to make it pass to other than natural heirs, was in opposition to the religious creed that was at the foundation of the law of property and the law of succession. The property being inherent in the worship, and the worship being hereditary, could one think of a will? Besides, property did not belong to the individual, but to the family, for man had not acquired it by the right of labor, but through the domestic worship. Attached to the family, it was transmitted from the dead to the living, not according to the will and choice of the dead, but by virtue of superior rules which religion had established. The will was not known in ancient Hindu law. Athenian legislation, up to Solon's time, forbade it absolutely, and Solon himself permitted it only to those who left no children. Wills were for a long time forbidden or unknown at Sparta, and were authorized only after the Peloponnesian War. Aristotle speaks of a time when the case was the same at Corinth and at Thebes. It is certain that the power of transmitting one's property arbitrarily by will was not recognized as a natural right, the constant principle of the ancient ages was, that all property should remain in the family to which religion had attached it. Plato, in his treatise on the laws, which is largely a commentary on the Athenian laws, explains very clearly the thought of ancient legislators. He supposes that a man on his deathbed demands the power to make a will, and that he cries. O oh gods, is it not very hard that I am not able to dispose of my property as I may choose, and in favor of any one to whom I please to give it, leaving more to this one, less to that one, according to the attachment they have shown for me? But the legislator replies to this man. Thou who canst not promise thyself a single day, 
Thou who art only a pilgrim here below, does it belong to thee to decide such affairs? Thou art the master neither of thy property nor of thyself, thou and thy estate, all these things, belong to thy family, that is to say, to thy ancestors and to thy posterity. For us the ancient laws of Rome are very obscure, they were obscure even to Cicero. What we know reaches little farther back than the Twelve Tables, which certainly are not the primitive legislation of Rome, and of these only fragments remain. This code authorizes the will, yet the fragment relating to the subject is too short, and too evidently incomplete to enable us to flatter ourselves that we know the exact provisions of the legislators in this matter. When they granted the power of devising property, we do not know what reserve and what conditions they placed upon it. We have no legal text, earlier than the Twelve Tables, that either forbids or permits a will, but the language preserved traces of a time when wills were not known, for it called the son the self-successor and necessary. Eres suset necessarius. This formula, which Gaius and Justinian still employed, but which was no longer in accord with the legislation of their time, came, without doubt, from a distant epoch, when the son could not be disinherited or refuse the heritage. The father had not then the free disposition of his fortune. In default of sons, and if the deceased had only collateral relatives, the will was not absolutely unknown, but was not easily made valid. Important formalities were necessary. First, secrecy was not allowed to the testator during life, the man who disinherited his family, and violated the law that religion had established, had to do this publicly, in broad daylight and take upon himself, during his lifetime, all the odium attached to such an act. This was not all, it was also necessary that the will of the testator should receive the approbation of the sovereign authority, that is to say, of the people assembled by curies, under the presidency of the pontiff. We must not imagine that this was an empty formality, particularly in the early ages. These comitia by curies were the most solemn assemblies of the Roman city, and it would be puerile to say that they convoked the people under the presidency of the religious chief, to act simply as witnesses at the reading of a will. We may suppose that the people voted, and we shall see, on reflection, that this was absolutely necessary. There was, in fact, a general law which regulated the order of succession in a rigorous manner, to modify this order in any particular, another law was necessary. This exceptional law was the will. The right of a man to devise by will was not, therefore, fully accorded, and could not be, so long as this society remained under the empire of the old religion. In the belief of these ancient ages, the living man was only the representative, for a few years, of a constant and immortal being, the family. He held the worship and the property only in trust, his right to them ceased with his life. Sixth. The Right of Primogeniture. We must transport ourselves beyond the time of which history has preserved the recollection, to those distant ages during which domestic institutions were established, and social institutions were prepared. Of this epoch there does not remain, nor can there remain, any written monument, but the laws which then governed men have left some traces in the legislation of succeeding times. In these distant days we distinguish one institution which must have survived a long time, which had a considerable influence upon the future constitution of societies, and without which this constitution could not be explained. This is the right of primogeniture. The old religion established a difference between the older and the younger son. The oldest, said the ancient Aryas, was begotten for the accomplishment of the duty due the ancestors, the others are the fruit of love. In virtue of this original superiority, the oldest had the privilege, after the death of the father, of presiding at all the ceremonies of the domestic worship, he it was who offered the funeral repast, and pronounced the formulas of prayer. For the right of pronouncing the prayers belongs to that son who came into the world first. The oldest was, therefore, heir to the hymns, the continuator of the worship, the religious chief of the family. From this creed flowed a rule of law, the oldest alone inherited property. Thus says an ancient passage, which the last editor of the Laws of Manu still inserted in the Code. The oldest takes possession of the whole patrimony, and the other brothers live under his authority as if they were under that of their father. The oldest son performs the duties towards the ancestors, he ought, therefore, to have all. 
Greek law is derived from the same religious beliefs as Hindu law, it is not astonishing, then, to find here also the right of primogeniture. Sparta preserved it longer than other Greek cities, because the Spartans were longer faithful to old institutions, among them the patrimony was indivisible, and the younger brothers had no part of it. It was the same with many of the ancient codes that Aristotle had studied. He informs us, indeed, that the Theban code prescribed absolutely that the number of lots of land should remain unchangeable, which certainly excluded the division among brothers. An ancient law of Corinth also provided that the number of families should remain invariable, which could only be the case where the right of the oldest prevented families from becoming dismembered in each generation. Among the Athenians we need not expect to find this old institution in full vigor in the time of Demosthenes, but there still existed at this epoch what they called the privilege of the elder. It consisted in retaining, above his proportion, the paternal dwelling, an advantage which was materially considerable, and which was still more considerable in a religious point of view, for the paternal house contained the ancient hearth of the family. While the younger sons, in the time of Demosthenes, left home to light new fires, the oldest, the true heir, remained in possession of the paternal hearth and of the tomb of his ancestors. He alone also preserved the family name. These were the vestiges of a time when he alone received the patrimony. We may remark, that the inequality of the law of primary geniture, besides the fact that it did not strike the minds of the ancients, over whom religion was all-powerful, was corrected by several of their customs. Sometimes the younger son was adopted into a family, and inherited property there, sometimes he married an only daughter, sometimes, in fine, he received some extinct family's lot of land. When all these resources failed, younger sons were sent out to join a colony. As to Rome, we find no law that relates to the right of primogeniture, but we are not to conclude from this that the right was unknown in ancient Italy. It might have disappeared, and even its traces have been effaced. What leads us to believe that before the ages known to us it was in force is, that the existence of the Roman and Sabine gens cannot be explained without it. How could a family reach the number of several thousand free persons, like the Claudian family, or several hundred combatants, all patricians, like the Fabian family, if the right of primogeniture had not maintained its unity during a long series of generations, and had not increased its numbers from age to age by preventing its dismemberment? This ancient right of primogeniture is proved by its consequences, and, so to speak, by its works.